Hey, this is Nicole C. Mullen, and you're on Faith's Edge with Joe Taylor. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, talk about it, say so, talk, talk about it. And it was incredibly reassuring to see his artistry because I'm part of it. And, and it really reinforced my trust and my faith in the artist who made me and is telling my story. Well, hello. Thank you, Nicole C. Mullen, for the introduction and the song. Nicole C. Mullen sang to me. How many of us can actually say that? What a great conversation Nicole and I had. We talked about surviving her night season of abusive and unfaithful relationships. She had an incredible relationship with her dad, and we talk a lot about that. We talk about her newest musical project, Like Never Before. It's a fantastic, fantastic new album. You can hear that conversation at onfaithsedge.com slash 102. Well, this is the 103rd episode of On Faith's Edge, and my name is Joe Taylor, recovering atheist and your servant in Jesus Christ. This is your place to hear conversations about God and living a life of faith in Jesus Christ. Man, I am excited to have author, screenwriter, filmmaker, N.D. Wilson with us today. N.D.'s work has been featured on NPR, The Today Show, and National Geographic. He's just releasing a groundbreaking new documentary called The Riot and the Dance. And it's in theaters nationwide for an encore performance on April 19th, 2018. If you are hearing this after April 19th, 2018, or for whatever reason the movie is no longer in theaters, go get the DVD. This movie is fantastic. Visually, is absolutely stunning. Andy and I talk about why he named this movie The Riot and the Dance. We talk about the real danger that he put himself in while making this film. How nature screams the existence of a creator. Andy and I have a really deep exchange about faith, the proof of Jesus, and his resurrection. Many of the things that Andy and I talk about in this part of, in that part of our conversation are the reasons I came to faith, or the reasons that I believe that Christianity uh, is the one true path to God. And I think you're going to get a lot out of this. But this film, The Riot and the Dance, gives faith a whole new perspective, gives creation a whole new perspective. The beauty, the groaning of nature is something that I don't think I've ever experienced before this documentary. And I think you will absolutely get a lot out of it. Explain the title, The Riot and the Dance. So when I was trying to name this doc, this nature documentary, I really wanted to capture two aspects of uh, the created world. One is this absolute, intricate, meticulous beauty, you know, this dance going on, the, you know, the seasons, caterpillars becoming butterflies, you know, the movements of a deer through sunlight in the forest, the face of a puma, you know, all these amazingly stunning things. But there's also all this death, all this destruction. And coming from a Christian perspective, you know, I attribute that all to the fall of man and the curse and all of creation groaning for the resurrection, groaning to be made new. So there's this mm. nature red in tooth and claw destruction, this chaos, this riot. But there's also shining through all that, this dance, this wondrous, amazing intricacy of the created order. So I wanted to try to capture and reflect both of those things. So that, that reference groaning comes from Romans, uh, chapter eight. Yeah, it does. So that, uh, Paul says there, the apostle Paul says that all of creation is groaning as in the pangs of childbirth. And he's talking about yearning for the resurrection, you know, yearning to be made new, you know, the way it was in the garden of Eden, uh, the new heavens, the new earth. So we see the groaning in creation. We see the death, we see the pain. Uh, the agony, but we also see this wonderful beauty, this promise of heaven, these pictures of paradise that shine through it all. You make the parallel between the riot, meaning the destruction, the death. I don't want to say the ugliness because, man, I, don't, I just don't think that's appropriate for, for any of God's creation. There's a beauty in all of it and a grace in all of it, even in the rotten, ugly parts, it seems. But that's the riot. Yeah. And then you have the dance, the beauty of God's creation, the elegance of God's creation the unbelievable splendor, the artistry uh, of God's creation. What, what was your most significant riot examples when you were making this film and your most significant dance examples? You know, I think the most significant riot example, which I really call out in the film, in the narration and this whole segment that we, I worked on this segment longer than any other segment is elephant seals where 
there are these amazingly hilarious, magnificent, massive creatures, and yet their behavior and their you know their, their socialization is basically a biker gang. You know, it's just this horrible, bloody rape and destruction all the time. These beach masters dominating these cows, these cows getting you know bitten by these massive bulls, pinned down while they're screaming, and and then uh, you know forcibly. <laughs> forcibly made it, shall we say. Um, and they're and just screaming the whole time. And when you're there filming, you're thinking, we, we can't show this. Like, this is like, <laughs> this is terrible. This is really, this is, and these animals are amazing. I mean, these animals are fantastic. And yet it's so laced with this, like you referenced ugliness. The animals themselves aren't ugly. They're comical and massive and even majestic in like a Star Wars creature kind of way. But um, but this this ugliness, this riot, this brokenness just stands out. It stands out more than anywhere else that I went, more than anywhere else that I saw. Um, a, a close second would be the highly, highly venomous snakes where these venoms are just so destructive and so far beyond our own chemical engineering we couldn't even begin to get there to to develop neurotoxins that deadly, uh, and you know, and snakes, venomous snakes, are they kill around a hundred thousand people a year. One hundred thousand a year wow. are killed minimum by venomous snakes. That's another example of like, okay, that's not how it's supposed to be. Um, then we have the promises, you know, in Isaiah that someday children will be able to play with the adder and put their hand in the cobra's den. You know, it's. At some point, this part of the riot will be will be done with it. You know, we'll be able to play with cobras uh, at some point. So the the elven seals and the venomous snakes that we caught really stood stood out to me as examples of deadliness, dangerousness, and darkness. In, and even so, I, they were awe inspiring. Like even in their even in their riot, even in their groaning, they they are awe inspiring creatures. And on the uh, dance side. You know, I've seen, I've seen hundreds and hundreds of hummingbirds in my life, but like setting up massive theatrical cameras and shooting in super slow motion and really studying them and watching them, you know, one wing beat at a time, uh, it had a profound effect on me. And you know, thinking of them, I, I wondered if they even experience time at a different at a different rate than we do. You know, like the rate that their heart beats, the rate that their wings beat. The fact that they're they're hatching out of eggs the size of pencil erasers, like a little pencil eraser that hatches into this super super rapid fire little bird that sips nectar, and they're totally egotistical and love fighting each other and territorial. They're like little musketeers that love to duel, and I loved I loved my time with them. Same thing with some other birds, uh, weaver birds. The intricacy of their nests, the complexity of their weaving, the impossibility of those nests was just, I mean, it just floored me. It really shocked me. And I have to say, uh, at one point, running into a wild elephant in the forest in Sri Lanka unexpectedly was another awe-inspiring moment to just sort of be standing there thinking, I hope this doesn't charge. Oh my God. You know, this enormous thing. It feels like a storybook creature. Like, surely this isn't real. This doesn't look realistic at all. (laughs) Like, this isn't, there's nothing realistic about this. It's way too awesome. And yet it's real. And here it is. And it's got this nose that picks things up with. And they have amazing memories and they mourn their dead. They grieve their dead. They even grieve human friends. So when somebody is befriended elephants uh, and dies, the elephants can become aware of the death over distance and will all appear at the dead man's house and mourn outside. You know, it's just there's they're magical creatures. And uh, there was a lot of that. There was so much where I was sitting here as a fantasy novelist, as somebody who's written a lot of fantasy for children, there's a lot of fantasy creatures out there in this world. We really do live in a fantasy universe. And the dance is everywhere. This the glory, beauty, wonder of creation. And everywhere also you can find the riot just to greater and lesser extents. Before making this film, did you have an ad- uh, adventurous spirit? Did, was this your thing <laughs> to, to hang out with nature and uh, look charging elephants in the eye and, and watch hummingbirds and all their majesty? So I grew up in a very bookish house. You know, my mom was an English teacher. My dad was a writer. I loved words. I loved stories. I loved writing. 
And I knew I always wanted to be a storyteller. But I also knew that the best kind of storytellers are the ones who live stories, who actually collect real stories. And I had an uncle who was a naturalist and he would take me out hunting fossils and catching insects and frogs. And, and I loved that. I loved it a lot. And when it came time to try to make a nature doc, which I'd wanted to do for a long time, I thought, you know, I, I want to do it with my uncle. And I want everyone else to have the experience of that adventure with my uncle that I had. And so I actually got my uncle, Gordon Wilson, the narrator of the film, is my uncle, the one who took me on all my adventures when I was a kid. And I took him on an adventure. You know, it's like, I was like, all right, we're going to Sri Lanka. We're chasing, we're chasing vipers in Arizona. We're doing all this craziness because I want to capture the same kind of wondrous experience I had in my own childhood with him and try to give it to as many other people as I could. And so I recruited him as narrator because of my childhood and because I've always been the kid that wanted to chase the adventure and catch the creature and dig up the fossils and, you know, see the, the cliffs where the ocean smashes and, you know, the sketchy parts, the dangerous parts. And I've always been that in large part because of him. So this is an extenuation of my childhood and of my relationship with him. Uh, and it's been really, really fun to do. How was that relationship as you guys were going on this adventure together? You said something just a minute ago that you had, then you took, he took you on adventures when you were a child and you took this opportunity to take him on an adventure. What was that relationship yes. like through this process? Super jolly, wildly fun, you know, staying out in field houses with no, no walls in very dangerous places. Uh, people getting, you know, just going into really sketchy places with an uncle. I know will always laugh and be cheerful under stress. You know, we were capable of doing really uh, some pretty intense things and just sitting and laugh at, you know, having a, having a drink afterwards and having an amazing laugh as we recounted what had just happened. So I also really loved, as a naturalist, he had a long bucket list of things he wanted to see and catch. And I loved getting to, you know, having the opportunity to help him check those boxes off. So, you know, we already are, we're in production on part two already. Uh, part one just came out, but in part two, we swam with sharks with no cage, you know, spent a couple hours in the water with these sharks circling us, about 30 sharks. And yeah, I've never had like an adrenaline peak like that, that just sustained for that long. And afterwards he got motion sick in the water and uh, it was hilarious because we're in, sh we're with sharks in the water and he's getting sick and we're trying to get him back in the boat before he thrashes too much or makes too much noise. And once we're all safe and back in the boat, it's like, wow, like we have this amazing story together now. Like we just added another layer. You now there's the stories from when I was a kid where we caught this or caught that, or the first time he showed me an anaconda in a, in a nature video, you know, when I was really young, I remember that clear, very clearly. And now we have stories about swimming with sharks together and catching cobras and flying snakes and all, all the crazy things that we've, we've seen together. So it was a massive expansion, but there was just so much joy. I mean, it was such a blessing to be able to do and uh, to do with him of all people. The footage that you captured ND in this project is stunning, breathtaking. Well, thank you. How did you capture such amazing footage? Well, uh, I think a willingness to go places you m maybe shouldn't go and, uh, and, and bring in a really high-end equipment where it's at risk, putting your equipment at risk, um, and even sometimes yourself, although as, as we did that as little as possible, but it's still the case. Um, we're just going for it, trying to capture the shot, trying to really, really get the vistas that we wanted. Um, a, willi a willingness to take those risks both for ourselves and also for our gear, for our very expensive gear. So, And then on the last piece of that was we took three years. So this was three years wow. of trips, like three years of efforts. And there were whole trips where we got almost nothing and where, where we used almost no footage at all. And other trips where we captured a lot and used a ton, Sri Lanka being one of those. You know, we shot in a lot of locations in Sri Lanka because there's so many different ecosystems and got amazing, amazing things uh, there. Whereas other places we, you know, we didn't, we maybe use two minutes of footage or we use 30 seconds of footage from a whole trip. So it was patience and then a willingness to kind of be out of our depth 
maybe a little bit crazier than we should have, but it really paid off for us. But it was really important to me to try to make it beautiful because this, this world is God's. I think it's beautiful. And the last thing I wanted to do is put together ugly footage and say, this is all God's. <laughs> Isn't this wonderful? And here's a really boring shot. Um, you know, I know that to try to deliver the message of the film, we had to set a really high bar cinematically and then take as long as it took to get over that bar. And so that's what we did. This film rivals any footage, uh, any cin- cinematography that you'll see in the best of, of documentaries about nature. Uh, it really, really is well done. Well, thank you. The interesting thing about this film is it is overtly God-based, but not ev- overtly Christian gospel message based. The goal for it was to get out and really just marvel to celebrate and not to convince, if that makes sense. As much as I love apologetics, as much as I love the role of convincing, I also wanted to just go out there and show everybody God's world. I really feel like we all, just to use a metaphor here, we all are like people who have the last name Disney. If we're all, if our last name was Disney and we're standing in Disneyland and we inherited all of it, don't you think we should look around a little bit? Don't you think we should pay attention to like what we've been given? And so the goal was not to convince people that their last name is Disney and they inherited all this. The goal is just to show them and to celebrate it and to, and to really wonder at it with them. So my goal is not to say there, there was a man named Walt Disney and you guys are all descended from him and this is all your inheritance. It's to assume that. I take that for granted. I, I you know presuppose that. I'm just going to show you all the awesome things that belong to us, that belong to all of us and celebrate them and celebrate the one who gave them to us. And I and not try to convince you of it. Just I'm going to show you. Yeah, I'm just going to take the camera and show you. And uh, so as a result, it's there's not a gospel presentation um, as such, but there is a celebration of God. There is there are direct references to the resurrection, to the groaning of creation, and so on. But it's not. This is not a gospel movie. This is a celebrating the museum, God's museum, the packed museum filled with His handcrafted creations. And uh, that's the goal. So that's the goal of it. So it's less about atonement and more about his natural revelation. What do you think uh, a believer will learn about God from this film? Well, this is kind of funny because when you read the book of Job, Job really goes through the ringer, right? I mean, he goes through the ringer. And when he cries out to God and God answers him, God says, have you seen the lions? Have you seen the ravens? Have you seen Leviathan? And shows him the natural world. God points him in his grief, in his trial, God po- points him to the natural world. And Job in chapter 12 ends up saying to everybody, to all of us, ask the beasts and they will teach you. Ask the birds and they will tell you. And it's, and it's what are they going to tell us? They're going to tell us that the hand of the Lord is in everything. You know, it's like that, that this is all his, that he's everywhere and that he's a meticulous artist who takes pleasure in his art. Now I spent the first two years of this production just knee deep in footage and trips and, you know, surrounded by terabytes of film footage. And then I found out that I had a brain tumor, a large egg sized brain tumor that was killing me, Mm. uh, cutting off my brain stem. It wasn't cancer, but it was still, you know, scary. I went into brain surgery and I came out of brain surgery And my job right on the other side of brain surgery was to write all the narration for this film. So two weeks after a life-threatening brain surgery, I find myself asking the beasts. I find myself exactly where Job did, being pointed to the animals. And in my hardship, in my trial, where did God send me? He sent me to the beasts. He sent me to the natural world. And it was incredibly reassuring uh, to see his artistry, to see how meticulous his craft was, because I'm part of it. And, and it really reinforced my trust and my faith in my author, in the artist who made me and is telling my story. As I go out there and see how much care he gives a weaver bird, how much care he gives a hummingbird, uh, I was absolutely encouraged and bolstered in my faith in that time. So it was odd to kind of like tread the, you know, to walk in a little way, the path that Job walked, where there was hardship, and then there was an extended period of time spent in natural revelation, learning more about my father. 
you know, studying his art and learning more about my father. And I, you know, I, in a very real way, I asked the beasts and they told me, um, and they really, I, it really worked that way. Um, uh, and it affected me greatly. And do you bring up a really good point because throughout the Bible, God points us to nature as proof of his power of proof of his existence of proof as his promises. God did it. Jesus did it. Consider the flowers, those types of verses. Yep. This film speaks to just that issue. You, you had to come into this project with a certain vision. What surprised even you while making this film? You know, I think the biggest thing is what I just described because I was expecting as I was making the film, I knew I wanted it to be beautiful. I knew I was going to take as long as it took to make it beautiful. I knew I wanted the, the narration to be compelling, but I definitely assumed I had more of an assumption that the narration would be factually driven information, you know, driven like information where it's the backbone would be fun facts about animals, you know, factoids about their habits. And those, you know, facts are there. They're definitely present. Information is present. But the thing that surprised me was how much theology there is, you know, in terms of at uh, a basic level, not like, oh, we're going to talk about, about perichoresis or something in the Trinity, but just a really profound uh, worshipfulness. I was not expecting to, as I, as I assembled it and as I extracted meaning and wrote narration for it, I was not expe- expecting to have myself such a worshipful experience doing that. And maybe I should have, but it really, it really did surprise me uh, to sit there and look at, look a Puma in the face and just be thinking, man, that's beautiful. It's so overwhelmingly beautiful. It's like, it's like a poem that moves you or a violin score, just something that really just kind of makes your knees shake a little bit and knocks you back with how striking it is. And it's made by a person. It's made by my father. Like my father crafted this. This is something that he left here for us. This is part of our inheritance. And this, this shows you his artistry. This shows you the, the beauty that exists out there. So the wonder and the worshipfulness was a surprise for me. Um, and I don't think it should have been a surprise, but it really was. It really took me aback when I was assembling it, you know, assembling the final cut and, and working on the narration. I was floored a lot, often, quite often by what I was faced with. Um, And I've had the same response from viewers. Viewers have told me the same thing where, you know, Christian musicians, fellow artists, you know, people I know on the other side of the country who are, are makers, they make beautiful things, you know, would text me and say, man, I just, I just saw a moth and I just stared at it in awe, you know, and I loved it. And I loved God more because of it. You know, just really, really like losing our calluses, losing our numbness and seeing some of the miracles around us for what they are. Just absolutely incredible creations. I mean, a moth, there's a worm, right? And the worm turns into liquid. It turns into soup and then reconstitutes itself as a flying object. You know, it's like just what on earth? That's fake. It's right out of one of my fantasy novels. There's no way that's real. And yet we see one and it's suiciding its way into our porch light. And, and we don't even think about it. And I think God's artistry is this way. So if you think about one of those things that we all, we tell all school children, there's no snowflake that is the same. When you get a microscope out and you look at a snowflake, they are incredible. Every school of architecture exists in ice crystals. Every one of them, you can find Gothic snowflakes. You can find Romanesque snowflakes and even really modernistic ones, you know, really abstract. Oh, it's bizarre. And then you think that God dumps a cabillion of them in your front yard. So many that we just, we can't even begin to appreciate it. And so we get out the ice and the shovel and we complain about it. You know, it's like, and he just throws it out there in your yard and then it all melts. He does that with, with ants. He does that with moths where he creates these amazing, amazing creatures and, and puts them out there for five minutes. You know, what he does with flowers, the lilies of the field, what he does with insects And they can be gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous, and miracles of engineering and things we can't even begin to comprehend. How do you take a worm, turn it into soup, but then make the soup turn into a flying object? Or in the case of a monarch butterfly, make the soup turn into a flying object that knows the way to Mexico and has a burning need to get there. Uh, It's really, really amazing. So when I hear from people that the film affected them the same way, 
that they see creation differently. Their, their calluses have been removed. They've kind of woken up to a lot of the miracles around them. That's the same process I went through. It's not something I was planning. It's something that happened to me as I was making the film. What are we going to get from part two? Well, we are, we, we've already had a lot of shoots uh, ranging from you know, chasing humpback whales to swimming with sharks, spawning salmon. Uh, and we have a great deal more planned. So we're, we're not going to be done. We have basically a year of production and then we'll move into post-production and hope to release part two in 2019. Uh, we really want to like unpack a lot of the symbolisms and uses of water and the water creatures. So part one focuses on earth and land creatures. Part two, we've just, we've just splashed right in to God's swimming pool and we've been hunting every kind of critter we can find, you know, and both ones we all know about like sharks and also really obscure ones, things we maybe never heard of, uh, things we take for granted, uh, that we might not want to look at, but they're just as amazing. Um, so I actually got scuba certified for that one. Um, as did my uncle. So we actually went through certification process together to prepare for the, the first shoots, uh, and then went for it. And it's been amazing. It's a whole new thing. It's one thing to sit in the forest and run into an elephant. It's another thing to have a shark sneak up behind you and have to kick it really quick. Oh my gosh. Um, or to have a guide or to have a guide tell me, just look them in the eyes and act really aggressive. And you think, look the shark in the eyes, like that's going to work. <laughs> and are they going to get close enough for me to do that? And the answer is yes, they do. These sharks would come right up. And if you just eyeball them really hard and lean towards them, then they would flinch away. You know, an 11 foot shark would flinch away just off the, the stranger stare, giving them the stink eye. Um, <laughs> it was, <laughs> so it was, it was a remarkable experience. And uh, that experience is far from over. We're still, we're still well underway. We're probably about 40% of the way through. Oh my gosh. Production I can't right wait, now, brother. I cannot wait. This film has been so well <laughs> received, ND. In fact, you have an encore theater release on April 19th. Uh, ND and I are talking on April 4th, 2018 right now. This film actually came out in 800 theaters nationwide, yeah. uh, which is unbelievable for a film like this 800 theaters nationwide it did so well that there's an encore performance on april 19th that has to make you feel good man oh uh, it does i'm really really grateful you know because we were starting from nothing right nobody ever heard of us nobody like we're not a brand right in the dance is not a well-known brand we're not the bbc creating this craft creating this film and then putting it out there having the theaters all love it and have more than 800 of them pick it up was awesome and then have them invite it back for an encore on april 19th i really am thrilled i really am grateful and the long-term goal is to you know green light three more of these we've got five planned total and if we can make this economically repeatable we'll keep doing it you know we're going to keep doing it we're not trying to make a bunch of money on it we just want it to support itself so we can keep doing it because we love it well done brother. oh thank you the word of God is not just in black and red letters on onion skin pages. It's living and breathing in the mountains, the deserts, and the trees. If we wanted to study somebody like Michelangelo, we would want to study all of his works of art, his paintings, his sculptures. The way you get to know God is to study everything that he wrote and made. How did you come to believe in Jesus Christ? Well, you know, I, I grew up in a Christian home and I had a very faithful parents. And so as a result, unlike a lot of people, uh, I did not have the experience of seeing hypocrisy in the home. I did not see my parents having a public faith, but then a private behavior. You know, I did not see my father. My father was not an angry man. He was very patient with me. 
And as a parent now, a lot of those stories that I have surprised me that he was so patient with me. Um, and the gospel was there. The gospel was presented. And at no time in my life do I remember disbelieving it. There were times where I had big questions that I was working through. Those were always encouraged. You know, we always had a lot of discussion about theology and scripture. No question was like off limits. You know, it was it was a very it was very much a place of discussion and dining room table conversation, uh, storytelling. You know, my dad would read aloud from scripture at the, at the dinner table, but also from the Narnia Chronicles and Lord of the Rings and other stories, other novels he wanted us to, to be familiar with. And as a result, through all those conversations, I was very young. You know, I was at a very young age, early elementary school, when I remember just being, you know, very, very sure that this, this really was true. And then later on, as I grew and questioned things, I think I was baptized around the age of 12. Uh, those, as, since those conversations were encouraged, I never really had a time of rebellion. I had a time of lots of questions and reading philosophers and having conversations with my dad about them. But my dad had a graduate degree in philosophy and loved those conversations himself. So it was not, uh, it wasn't scary navigating those things, um, you know, working through the problem of evil, um, et cetera. So then I, I went off to, I went to a Christian liberal arts college, went off to graduate school. And it was really in college that, you know, my, in, in a very real way, my faith had to become my own, where I was out there encountering a great deal of unbelief and had to be able to express the gospel and explain the gospel and defend the gospel for myself. But I am grateful to my parents that I was equipped to do so and that, that uh, I, they really had made sure that I took ownership of my own faith much, much younger than that. So it wasn't tested until that age, um, but I had taken ownership of, of it much younger. So I've never been, in a very real way, I can say I've never been away from Christ. Uh, I've always been you know, brought up in the, within the light of the gospel, and I took root there. I took root there and grew there. So that's really, you know, in a nutshell, that's my testimony. These family discussions when you were, when you were a kid, uh, talking about faith and talking about philosophy and reading the Chronicles of Narnia and reading from the Bible— what are what is one what are one or two significant moments, important memories that you have from those times? I'd say the nature of God's sovereignty, you know, the nature of his the level of his artistry, how much control he has. You know, uh, uh, the story in Exodus of God hardening Pharaoh's heart. Um, you know, it's like that's and what Pharaoh's role was in that narrative, and beginning to shift in my thinking towards. God, from God, the creator to God, the author, um, God, the artist, God, the author, where he's crafting tension, where he's creating characters and, and character arcs, and he's creating even structures and foreshadowing in reality and then bringing resolution um, and starting to process history and also the stories in scripture in that way was a major transition for me. Um, instead of God, the puppeteer, you know, God, the puppeteer is uh, not not in any way a compelling God, but God, the author is. And so coming to understand his sovereignty in that light was big for me. Um, also, you know, to get more into the, into the weeds, I would say a belief that the gospel will triumph. The great commission will be fulfilled. You know, I don't, I don't think that we're going to be all helicoptered out of here in a rapture. I think that the gospel is going to win. We're going to win. And God is patient. It's going to take thousands of years. It already has. But if you look at how much ground has been gained by 12 fairly low class guys in the Middle East over the last 2000 years, uh, it's amazing. It's remarkable. So give us another 10,000 years on this planet. And I think that the gospel will have triumphed and the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. So coming to that, you know, that position was also big for me. And that's more unique within Christendom. Um, I have lots of friends who disagree with me on that, who are waiting for the helicopters to get them out of Saigon, basically, um, where I think we're going to win. Like, I think, I think Jesus is going to win uh, and he's going to win in every way. Uh, that was big. And then also processing the covenant, the concept of covenant and God's promises to families and to peoples. Uh, that's a big, big topic, but that was Sub, you know, very substantive in my in my own development. You know, I'm thinking of myself as belonging to God, 
not just volunteering for God, but I belong to him and I can live for him faithfully or I can be unfaithful. The choice is between belonging to God and being unfaithful or belonging to God and being faithful. Not a question of volunteering and letting him have me. You know, where actually, no, he has me already. He makes me. He gave me every heartbeat, every electrical current in my brain, every thought. I can't have any of those without him. I can't make my hand continue to exist without him. I cannot, so I cannot sustain myself. So in him, in him, we live and move and have our being uh, really meaning something to me. And so I am his. He is the potter. I am the pot. And I can rebel and try to defy him and try to be unfaithful, or I can submit and be faithful. But there's no question of ownership. You know, the ownership is beyond dispute. I'm his. You mentioned that you never really had a time in your life, ND, where you questioned your faith or the existence of God or anything like that. But were, what were some of the tough questions that you wrestled with uh, in your faith as you were growing up and into? Because most of the, a lot of those questions typically come in uh, early adulthood into our 20s and even into our 30s. What were some of the real tough questions that you that you had to work through? I think that honestly, on a philosophical level, the nature of knowledge and certainty. Uh, you know, we're told in scripture, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But as a, as a philosophy student and studying philosophy in graduate school as well, myself, you know, it's really easy to drift into a modernistic assumption that each of us needs to have total and absolute certainty about a thing. Um, and that's just not a biblical concept. So the, the modernistic quest for absolute certainty within an individual is not possible because we are goldfish in a bowl and goldfish in a bowl trying to be absolutely certain about the outside world is pretty comic. I mean, that's, it's, it's kind of a futile quest, but when you think that I need to personally establish every aspect of God's character in the courtroom of my own mind, where I establish them all beyond the shadow of a doubt, like, you know, some attorney, I'm not going to be capable of that. And the nature of faith versus the nature of knowledge, the nature of placing my trust in God, my trust in scripture, my trust in the spirit, my trust in the son, um, and being willing to not be judge and jury for every single cosmic question. And as a very, you know, busy little intellectual, I really wanted to be judge and jury for every single question, but you can't, I'm a finite creature. I can't even prove that George Washington existed. Um, you know, like that's just, I have to trust other people about that. Um, I can't prove that I was born on August 12th, 1978. I have to trust other people for that. I can't prove beyond a shadow of a doubt who my grandparents were. I have to trust other people for that. So like, we're all very, very finite and we operate on trust by trust and faith all the time. But when it comes to cosmic questions, suddenly we get scared and we want to have some kind of absolute, certain, neutral, uh, objective knowledge that is really beyond our grasp instead of trusting and having faith. Isn't the nature of faith ND uh, knowing enough to take a tiny step and then moving forward so you know a little more to take another tiny step and moving forward to take another tiny step? And as you experience God, as you experience his goodness, uh, you you build, your faith builds, and you're able to take bolder steps and larger steps. And then you eventually run in your faith. You know, absolutely. And I think that, um, I think that's true for a lot of people. That's a great description of it for many, many people. But I also think that mankind, uh, if we, if we just switch over metaphorically and, and view people like dogs, you know, if we're all different breeds of dogs, right. And personality wise, there's golden retrievers and labs and pointers and German shepherds. And there are really skittish, highly intelligent dogs there are very, very cautious, nervous dogs where you really have to earn their trust. You know, they're going to hang back and there's going to be dogs jumping all over you trying to lick your face. Um, and I really think that faith for each of us, there's, there's a different kind of journey. Um, and God absolutely cultivates faith in people incrementally. And for some people, it's exactly what you described. It's a little step. And then you're not betrayed. Your faith is not betrayed. You get to know a little bit more and you take another step, you know, but you're walking out on the ice 
and you're waiting for the ice to break underneath you and it doesn't. And so you go a little further and then it doesn't and you go a little further. But there's also people like me where uh, my parents communicated uh, biblical parenting and biblical truth and biblical love so well and effectively that I was never that nervous dog. I was never that one that really hung back and, and really waited. Uh, I sort of enthusiastically jumped in. And of course, sometimes that's not terribly helpful, but, um, I was like a golden retriever next to a swimming pool. It's kind of hard to, hard to keep me out, um, <laughs> as opposed to other dogs, which were, you know, which were, which were terrified, you know, just kind of like, I wasn't the dog that hated baths. Let's put it that way. Um, I have dogs like that now, <laughs> but, um, there's, there are ways in which, uh, I think faith, the way faith grows varies person to person, but ultimately it's all a gift from God and it's all cultivated by God. It's all faith by grace. Um, it's not faith that we conjure up inside ourselves. Um, it's all of grace. Yeah. You know, it's all God's kindness. And I have friends who were like, you know, hung back, super nervous and were coaxed out over years and through years of discussion and years of worry and fear and doubt. Uh, and then that faith grew, it took root and it grew and grew. And now a decade later, they're extremely strong in their faith. They're running in their faith, as you said. And, uh, other people who were overconfident and just leapt in and said, yeah, no, I have no, no doubts. Everything's fine. And then hypocrisy caught up to them. They, they cultivated sin in their lives and they didn't want to do anything about it. And their faith wavered and, you know, it's like, and, and they fell away. You know, it's like, so I think the parable of the sower tells us there's lots of different kinds of soil and there's not just lots of different kinds of soil in that some hearts, faith doesn't take root and some it does. There's lots of different kinds of hearts where faith takes root. There's people like the apostle Paul who had to get his butt knocked off a donkey by a blinding light. You would say where it, it had to be done that way. Um, and, and so on. There are people, and here, here's a fun fact for you. Uh, it's, it bends my mind every Easter when you think who were the first people who knew that Christ had risen from the dead, you know, just historically speaking, who were the first people that knew? And the answer is the guards, not the women, not the apostles, the guards at the tomb knew first. And what did they do with that knowledge? They did not have faith. They ran and told the Pharisees, you know, the, the, the Sanhedrin who had killed Christ. And what did they do? They were the second people. The second people who knew were the people who'd executed Christ. And they paid the guards not to tell anybody. And they obviously didn't have faith. And then you have Thomas, doubting Thomas, who doesn't believe. And he is coaxed and led along. And then he does believe and his faith grows and grows and grows. Um, so there's a lot of variation knowledge is not the same thing as faith. Seeing is not the same thing as believing as much as we'd like to say it is because the guards and the Sanhedrin all saw that Christ had risen um, and still turned away from him. Uh, when Christ raised Lazarus from the dead, which is astounding, you know, he calls a man who's been in a tomb for four days to come forth and Lazarus hops out in his burial clothes. And part of the crowd responded by going away and plotting to kill Jesus. We're talking about a guy who just raised the dead. Right. He just raised a guy from like four days dead. He gets called out of the tomb. And your response to that knowledge is, I want to kill him. On the last day, there will be no one who, who doesn't know if there's a God. There will be no atheists on the last day. There will be, a, there will be no atheists in hell at all. There will be people who hate God and would rather be in hell than in heaven with God. So there will be people who hate him and there will be people who love him, but there will be no one who says, I'm not convinced that he exists. That mystery will be solved. That will be over with. And the question will be, do you love him or do you not? Do you want to be like him? Do you want to be with him or do you not? Um, and that, I think that's what's going to come down to. So we see that in the New Testament. We see people watch Lazarus raised from the dead and they say, I hate him. I want to kill that guy. And then the guards tell the Sanhedrin, he, he came back from the dead. He has power even over death. And they say, we hate that guy. We want to cover this up. That's their response. And then there's others who love him and their faith is cultivated in different ways and at different rates, you know, ranging from Mary Magdalene and the women whose faith was the strongest to Thomas, 
who whose faith was famously the weakest. And man, would it be, it'd be kind of a bummer, by the way, to be the guy the guy in the Bible who got to know Jesus, but is famous for being the one who didn't believe. How profound is that? The people who had who probably knew more about the resurrection than any of us may ever know. The when, absolutely, the where, the how, exactly what happened. They were standing right there when this happened. Yep. The knowledge of Jesus himself was not enough to transform them. Now we don't know what happened to those guards after, after, after that. They could have very right. well been become followers of Jesus, but the the scriptures don't speak to that, from what I know. Um, I actually think that at least some of them did. Okay. Or else we wouldn't know. We wouldn't know that the Sanhedrin offered the money not to talk. That's a good point. And so I think at least some of them did, but we know the Sanhedrin didn't. The Sanhedrin yeah. offered the guards money not to talk, and the guards' first instinct was to run to the Sanhedrin. It is weird, but I know the human heart is that way. Well, all of us have hearts that way. God could miraculously save us with manna today, and tomorrow we'd be complaining and doubting Him. Like that's that's the way that we are. We're we're funny little creatures that he some for some reason loves. If God Himself came down right now and 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 appeared, however you would expect Him to appear, and you asked Him for proof that He is God, uh, and He did not give you the answer that you wanted, you still wouldn't believe. Absolutely, you want to be the judge and the jury instead of submitting and realizing that you have no authority and He has all the power and the authority. So instead of submitting to him and saying, you know, forgive me, Lord, instead of being the thief on one cross, that's another one of the miracles. Imagine getting crucified next to Jesus. And you think, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to be a smart ass. I <laughs> I might be getting I, I might be getting crucified also. Like I also am in excruciating pain, literally excruciating. And I'm going to I'm going to run my mouth. Right. Like I'm going to run my mouth at this guy even though the same people are killing me. Um, absolutely, we're that way. So one thief taunts him and one thief repents. One thief is getting crucified and it's the best day of his life because his entire life led him to a moment when he got nailed on a tree beside the maker of the universe, beside the infinite creator word. And when he spoke to him, Christ spoke back and told him, I'll be with you in paradise. That day, a man who was a thief and deserving of death got crucified and was with Christ in paradise directly. He and his, like his story was linked forever with the story of Jesus Christ, Lord of the universe. You know, he was there. And then the other guy on the other side, you know, he gets to spit and curse just like the, you know, the soldiers below um, just, you know, made a slightly incorrect choice there. But we also know like the, we're talking about the curtain in the temple ripped the sun was blotted out. There was an earthquake. And then he came back from the dead. And people are like, oh, gosh, how do we how do we shut this up? <laughs> Can we you just give us PR one message. more one more proof? One more yes. thing? <laughs> just, just, is there something else that could be done? And then on top of that, the graves in Jerusalem open up. And he brings back piles of people. And then he appears to hundreds of people for over 40 days. You know, it's like, this is just, and people still like, that's actually a lot firmer than a lot of the things we take as fact, even about world war II, when people talk about things, general patent did or did not do, they have to depend on one or two witnesses. We have hundreds of witnesses who told thousands of people and it's, and the, and the firsthand witnesses all wrote down their accounts. Like, and we have them still to this day. And, and we have so much more evidence, just thundering evidence than, than we have that George Washington crossed the Delaware. More people, you know, were, were there for Christ's appearances after his resurrection than were there when George Washington stood in his boat and put his, you know, his foot up on the front of the boat. Um, it's pretty funny. And we just take that for granted. Like, yeah, no problem. The reason why we don't doubt those things is because the existence of George Washington doesn't demand that we change our lifestyles, does not demand that we change our priorities, does not demand that we give ourselves to, to him and to his purpose. But the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, the fact that he has all authority, that all authority is given to him and that he proved it, man, we don't want that to be true. It's like, so we, we take things as historically factual on very little evidence 
when it doesn't mean we have to change our lives. But as soon as it means there is a king and we need to serve him, that we have to submit our lives to him, uh, oh man, we'll wriggle and squirm and come up with every doubt we can. Isn't the resurrection interesting? One of the things that sealed the deal for me, Andy, and I call myself a recovering atheist. I came to faith through a very logical, reasonable process. Uh, I still have a have a uh, a fight with cynicism and skepticism about my faith. But when you look at the resurrection, there is not there is not a single historical event that has been more scrutinized and investigated than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And through all all modern methodology and through all ways of proving historical events, the resurrection of Jesus Christ comes out as a real event that happened. Absolutely. And it's more, and we have more evidence of that and more eyewitness accounts and more after the fact eyewitness accounts who saw him alive after they saw him crucified. We have more of those than we have for any number of things that Alexander the Great did. It's like any number of things that happened even during World War II in the last century, you know, where there's, there's big fights about how things went down. You know, what did Franklin Roosevelt know when? Did we know about Pearl Harbor? What's the, like, there's all this stuff, you know, it's like, that's, and, and we have all this evidence that actually like puts us on a stronger foundation than we, than we even are for very recent history. So we're in an extremely strong position and there's, there's really no reason at all. There's no justifiable reason. If you talk about rationality to disbelieve and it's like, that's, there, there really needs to be. Because somebody 2,000 years later says, I'm going to be judge and juror, and I would like everything to be reestablished in my presence, please. It's like, well, you weren't born 2,000 years ago, so you can't talk to firsthand witnesses. But they did write it down. And, and we know it was them who wrote it. Like, all of this is historically established. And the other thing, as, as uh, I can't remember who said this, but uh, it might have actually been Bono. Um, but maybe not, who knows, where he said, basically, you know, a guy did something 2000 years ago. And then what we can witness personally is lives change now. Like we see lives changed in front of us. We see personalities swing. We see alcoholics win victories over, over their demons. We see horrible, selfish men become sacrificial. We see vain women become giving and loving. We see Christ continue to work miracles around us all the time and how he reshapes humanity and how he reshapes individuals. So it's not all 2000 years ago. We also see the proof and the putting around us in the lives of the converted in the lives of those who cry out to Christ. Um, absolutely. And the other thing is, as I saw one guy, I, I wish I could give credit. Somebody tweeted on Easter. You have people were martyred. They were burned at the stake. They were fed to lions over their eyewitness testimony about Christ's resurrection. They died rather than retract. You know, it's like you look at Watergate and there's 12 dudes couldn't keep a secret for two weeks. They couldn't cover a lie for two weeks. They just caved. And we're talking about powerful men. Powerful men just crumpled under pressure and could not maintain a lie. And you'd be telling, if this was a lie, you're talking about a lie that thousands of people participated directly in, thousands of them, and then they all were willing to die for it. They all were happy to be torn by a lion, to be burned at the stake in Nero's garden parties over it. You know, like that's, and that is, a, that is next level commitment. So it is a, I mean, this, the knowledge of Jesus' resurrection, people attempted to trample it out any number of ways. And it just failed. It was like stomping on sparks where it only just spread the sparks. That's how big this event was that we are feeling, we are feeling the, that impact 2000 years later, as real as it was then. And finally, as we wrap up ND, we've answered a lot of these questions in, in this, uh, in this discussion, kind of put it in a box for us. What would you say to that person that is right on faith's edge, making that choice to believe or not to believe in God? Uh, I don't think I can say anything better than just taste and see that the Lord is good. I can't, I can't do anything better than that. Just if you're sitting there thinking, do I, don't I? There's absolutely nothing to lose. And there's an eternity to gain. Taste and see that the Lord is good. 
And if you want proof of the creation of God and the beauty of God, uh, there is nothing better than the riot and the dance. Well done, my friend. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this conversation. And thanks for hanging out with me. Take care. You can find out more about the Riot and the Dance at riotandthedance.com. ND's website is ndwilson.com. And the Riot and Dance, has, as I said before, has a special encore presentation in theaters nationwide on April 19th. You will not regret seeing this on the big screen. I'll put the website, links to the movie, and the social media links in the show notes at onfaithsedge.com slash 103. That's onfaithsedge.com slash 103. If you want to contact me directly, I am most active on Twitter at at 4 Taylor. That's at F-O-R-J-O-E-T-A-Y-L-O-R. Or you can contact me at onfaithsedge.com slash contact. I genuinely love bringing you engaging conversations about faith. If this show entertains you, encourages you, informs you, or brings value to you in any way whatsoever, will you consider financially backing the show? And the best way you can do that is to use any Amazon link at onfaithsedge.com. We'll get a modest commission from the purchase, but it won't cost you a penny more. Well, that'll wrap up today's show. Thank you to N.D. Wilson for being with us, and thank you for listening. You mean a lot to me, and you mean a lot to this show. Remember, God is real, He loves you, and so do I. God bless. Thank you for listening to On Faith's Edge. You can subscribe to the show via iTunes, Stitcher, Internet Radio, or your favorite podcast app on Android, Apple, or Windows devices. To reach out to Joe or leave comments about the show, visit onfaithsedge.com. You're important to us, and we would love to hear from you. 